Welcome to a regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors of Sutter County. Could you call roll, please? Here. 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 Okay, next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Sharon, could you lead us to the salute to our flag, please? Our next item is the approval of the minutes of May 8th, 2001 regular session. Make a motion we approve the minutes as submitted. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, carries unanimously. Next item is public participation. This is the time where members of uh, the public can comment uh, to the board on items that are have not been agendized and so this will be an excellent time I've got several yellow cards here for people that are concerned about growth in the Robbins community and so this is an excellent excellent time for you to come up and make comments realize however that the board cannot give a decision uh, however uh, we sure are here to listen to you so you can come up at any time you'd like What's the first name you had well, I could call out names, but it'll put you on the spot. Name and address, please. Hello, my name is Byron Miracle. I'm from Robbins, District 5. And uh, I've spoken with Dan Silver regarding the development, proposed development of Robbins. And I have some concern about the uh, type of development that's going on in the town regarding not only flooding issues, but also the impact on the city because it seems to be pretty significant. We're going from about 40 homes in Robbins and we're gonna double the size according to uh, the plan that Mr. Cusick uh, has proposed. And um, I just have some basic concerns about being a good neighbor developing the property that will have the best impact regarding the school, safety issues, uh, impact on the roads, um, property values, and um, that's basically why we're here today. Um, I'm trying to find out as much information as I can regarding the plans and it's a little cloudy right now and um, it's mostly a fact-finding mission that we're here today. Um, we definitely do not oppose the growth of the town but we want to do it in a responsible manner. You know, we moved to Robbins over 11 years ago because of the charm of the city. We all had big yards, and I'm not sure the whole council is familiar with what the plans are there, but um, I've spoken with Mr. Silva about it, and I'm sure he is familiar. And I just have concerns as being a good neighbor uh, about a lot of issues. You know, the protection of our property value the integrity of the small town community that exists now. And I'm very concerned about the growth uh, of the town. Not opposed to it, but according to the information that we've received so far, it looks like it, it could be a situation that would not show the best interest for the community. There is a definite lack of planning within the Robbins community. Um, I've researched as much as I can the website of the Sutter County general plan and it's very ambiguous and consequently someone can come in and do minimal requirements of county uh, restrictions 
as far as you know the development, but I I do question its um, uh, motive for the betterment of the community, and I'm sure that's my time. So thanks for listening, and I will try to keep in contact with everybody involved, um, and I'll do so any any means possible. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Combs, could you refresh my memory? I, I <coughs> heard about this Robin, Robin's project recently. I know that we talked, dis you discussed it with me a while ago, but I've sort of forgotten. This is a proposal uh, by one landowner who owns a significant number of parcels in the community of Robins to develop those parcels. There are approximately, I believe, 15 lots, correct me if I'm not remembering correctly, Mr. Silva. Uh, that can be developed immediately and have no restrictions on them. They're on a county road. They have R1 zoning. They can be developed. And then there is another um, large amount of acreage that has a map on it on which the owner at the time uh, agreed to certain conditions, which they, the uh, current owner, Mr. Cusick, and the previous owner, have met with the Public Works Committee on requesting some variance in those conditions because development on the property wouldn't be uh, financially feasible in the way that the current owner wishes to do based on those conditions. Um, I'm not sure where that is right now. I know that it's been to the committee what, a couple of times. What kind of conditions are we talking about? Streets, <coughs> sidewalks, There's standard, There's standard conditions the county puts on uh, subdivision development, roads, sidewalks, drainage. So as all, as my, my, my recollection is we're requiring that throughout the county. We do require it throughout the county where the county has the ability to do that conditioning. So for instance, where, if, I'm sorry, where what? Where we have the ability to do that conditioning, which would be in an area that there is no current allowed development. For instance, if there's a single lot on your street right now, <coughs> excuse me, that is zoned, the county can't tell the person who owns that lot, you have to meet these conditions if you're going to develop. However, if there is a larger lot, as there is, for instance, across the street from your house, where people want to develop, they have to come in and get a map from the county. That's a discretionary act. And since the early 80s, the county, when somebody came in and asked for that, has placed conditions on those maps having to do with the infrastructure improvements that have to be made on those lots. So there's two types of issues here. We have some lots, as I described, about 15 that we don't have any ability to put conditions on. There are a larger number of lots that we do have the ability to put conditions on. Those conditions have been entered into, and the current owner is requesting some variance of that. But again, I don't know the current status. It has not been to the Board of Supervisors. As far as I know, it's only been to the committee. It's been before the committee twice. Um, Which committee? The Public Works oh, Committee. Okay. Uh, there's been certain requests made, and I'd like, George, could you go into what has transpired up to this point? Um, I know there's been a request from us to change the requirements, and... Mr. Chairman, as, as you recall, at the meeting, basically, Mr. Cusick, uh, we told Mr. Cusick that our requirement is to stick to the original agreement requiring, requiring curbs, gutters, and sidewalks. And um, the, the, the way we left it after the meeting, that uh, Mr. Cusick is going to come back with a the, with the, with the proposal to improve uh, uh, Pepper Street uh, in front of those lots. And uh, that will include curbs, gutters, and sidewalks, and st street drainage. Okay. Now, Mr. Miracle lives on Oak Street, and uh, that's part of the area of which we don't have conditions requiring curbs, gutters, and sidewalks, and street paving. But we're requiring Mr. Cusick to make sure that he doesn't cause a problem to the property owners in that area. And one of the things we're going to be requiring him to do, either retain all drainage on site or um, do some drainage improvements along that area so that, you know, that he wouldn't make the problem any worse, hopefully better. So, but we haven't seen anything from Mr. Cusick yet. Why do we not have the ability to require curbs, gutters, and sidewalks on Oak Street? 
That, that property has existed. Uh, it's zoned R1. Uh, there it was not involved in any lot line adjustment or a map or anything like that. So we can only make those uh, conditions and requirements on newly. Uh, Supervisor Bechtel, to clarify, uh, your board uh, can only impose such conditions when a property is asking for a discretionary act on the part of the county. But in, in, the, in, in the case of the existing lots, we have the authority to impose conditions under the encroachment pro permit procedure. But uh, those conditions have to mitigate the impacts on the road. And that's where we can require drainage improvements. And the reason for the 15 house number is the capacity of the sewer system. And it's on a first come, first served basis. That's correct. Yes. It's the ability also of fill-in. The, the infill in the, in the community of Robbins, I think, only has 15 existing lots for infill. Isn't that, is that somewhere? That's not the right? reason. Uh, my understanding, the, the, the capacity in the treatment plant, we have 5,000 gallons per day capacity left in the discharge permit. We, we believe the 5,000 gallons per day will, will be able to connect 15 homes. Okay, we'll be monitoring as homes are hooked up, and we have, it, we have, we have a meter at the plant. So it would be approximately 15. It might be a little bit more, maybe less. Uh, but my understanding that uh, Mr. Cusick, along with Sutter Basin Corporation, have about, I'm not, I think they have eight lots within the it, town. Yeah, they had 12, 12 lots, but out of that we determined that eight of them were actually available lots. Right. The other four were on an unimproved road or they have to provide access. So therefore, and Mr. Cusick at our last public works meeting agreed with that, that the, you know, basically had eight available lots around the community of Sutter that he could build on independently. Um, or build in the area that he wants to, which has a, a lot line adjustment or a map on it, which would set the conditions Mr. Masalm is talking about. And so it's back in Mr. Kusick's court to come back to George uh, Works Public Works. He's our deputy public works director to come back to public works and show public works what he's planning on doing. And that's where we left it with Mr. Kusick at our last public works meeting. And basically he was told that he, he can do quite a bit just by right as long as he follows whatever the rules are. And the curbs we're talking about are the rolling type of curbs. It's not the square, so it's a little more country look. He had asked for uh, reduction of street widths, uh, elimination of curbs and, and sidewalks, and, and the uh, committee was not willing to do that based on the standards we've had other developers held in the community of Sutter and places like that. And so we informed him they'd have to do that. And he, at least at the meeting, concurred that he would at the public works meeting and we'll see now if Mr. Cusack does come back with a proposed showing that he's going to do curb gutter sidewalks along uh, Pepper Street. It's up to him. It's back to him to, to come in now and, and show us what he's planning on doing. We did also tell him that this is only a committee of two and that the recommendation of our, us two would be that to hold him to the requirements. And so it was his choice. He could have taken it further than this committee and gone to the full board. But he says, if you guys are against it, then therefore I won't take it any further. And so he's taken it back to do more study on his part. Okay, at this time, uh, William or, or, let me. Okay. <laughs> okay. My name is Catherine Miracle, and I live at 17254 Oak Street. And I did want to say thank you very much um, for the fixing of our roads. When we saw you out there fixing, we said, hey, how, how about Oak Street? And they said, maybe next year. But then that week it got done. So I did want to say thank you very much. Um, I also worked at Robbins School for six years as their special ed teacher. And I think that Robbins does have a very big community when they want to keep, um, we want well thought of growth and strong community spirit and the small town feel. When you come to California, you don't think of no stoplights, very few stop signs, being able to really know a lot of people around you. And when something comes to change, we wanted to make sure that our voices were heard and just not having, um, being quiet. Um, one of some of the concerns we have would be traffic, increased traffic, the kids that are out playing. Um, yes, it is our concern to make sure that the kids know to be safe, but we do have head-ons and deaths every year. Um, our flooding issue was very big. We flooded in 95 and 98, and so that is a very big concern for my husband and Mike. 
and we have continually thought about it since the first time that we were flooded. Um, we want growth to be beneficial for all of us. We want it to, when we're considering growth, we want to just, you know, how would we feel if somebody else did it right next to us? Some of the people that are um, selling the lots have no opportunity for growth to be right around them. They know what will be around them forever. Um, so th thanks again to the Public Works and what is being done for Robbins. Thank you for listening to us. I was trying to take notes because if anything wants to be improved for us as well, I think that there are times that we are willing to improve for the good of Sutter County. Um, I like hearing about the holding the water on their own lot next to us because that, if they have to be 10 inches above the street, that is a concern for us. Um, the, most of the lots that are up for development are six right across the street from us and two in between Mike and us. And so when we talk about the development, I would think that the major impact is right around us on Oak Street and also where some of the babysitting is done right on um, San Francisco and the corner of Oak. And so for our children, I really do want us to keep all of these things in mind. And we did not want to be silent. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is William Spear. I live at 17320 Oak Street. And um, I lived there for 10 years, and my house is in the middle of Oak on that end. And I, I think the board should know that Oak Street is a dead end street. It doesn't have an outlet on the, on the, on the far end. And, and the street pavement is probably only about 20 feet wide, so it's a very narrow street. Mr. Cusick's planning to come in and build two houses between uh, me and the Miracles, which has been an empty lot ever since. And uh, prior to us having a sewer system in Robbins, which I, I've worked real hard to get and to solve our problem there because shortly after I moved in my house, I discovered that you know the septic tanks didn't work and I, and I struggled with that for a number of years. But um, prior to that, you had to have two parcels in Robbins in order to uh, construct a house. Um, and that's because of the land required for a leach field. And so Mr. Cusick's plan is now that we have the sewer system is to take advantage of that and because there's two parcels and build a house on each parcel. And it's my feeling that that's going to create a higher density of, of population and what's a country feel. It's uh, uh, Robbins is kind of a small community, but we all have space from each other. You know, if you crank up the TV loud with the windows open, your neighbor probably can't hear it. But from what Mr. Cusick's planning, you know, the house is going to be less than five feet from the side of the lot. So my lot, my house is kind of built off to one side, and, and I'd be real close to whoever he, whatever he constructed. So it, it was my feeling that it's not fair for him to come in and change that, that look and feel of Robbins. My other concern is the sewer system that we worked really hard to get, is that he comes in and he does this construction, and it somehow will impact the maintenance fee that we have to pay on that by increasing the amount of flow into that treatment facility and that once that it's the flows there that somehow or another we'll lose our federal permit to discharge water out of that treatment facility and then we also have to look forward to whether or not the arsenic level standards are going to be changed by the Bush administration and if they're lowered we may not meet that criteria for our water that we have in town so once all that new construction started, you're going to have a lot more people impacted by the, the arsenic level in the water in, in the town of Robbins. My other concern is the fire department. We just have a volunteer fire department now that has to take care of it. If the power goes out in Robbins, we have no ability to pump water. There is no backup generator and other than a fire truck dropping a hose in a ditch. You know, depending if it's a house in the middle of town, it's going to take a while before they get water from a ditch out to put that fire out. So that issue needs to be addressed. Um, you know, bringing in eight more houses on, on Oak Street is probably going to increase the amount of traffic and it's going to hamper what we have. So I think the county, because the existing conditions are there, I don't think it's fair that he can come in and build a lot more houses without having to address the sidewalks and drainage issue. And being that I'm in the middle of the street, I honestly think that two more houses is going to create a larger flooding problem that I've encountered every years since I've lived there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the only thing I could say is that we can hold, the, hold them to what our regulations are. Um, however, 
the chances of somebody building next to you may still happen. I'm not opposed to having <clears throat> a house next to me, but I, I always thought it would be one house, not two houses. But if it's two lots? I have two parcels also. Yeah. I understand that, but we, we can only stick with what the rules are. And so some of those things we cannot change. I just want to let you know that. The other question I had with the three of you here, who's watching Robbins? The other 40 people. <laughs> just checking. Okay, thank you for coming. And if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to call any of us personally. Uh, I know I return calls, and I think every one of these board members returns calls. So give us a call if you need to. Okay, we also have uh, Sharon Foote. You'd like to address the topic this evening? Good evening, I'm Sharon Foote. I reside at 1461 Thomas Drive in Yuba City, and I'm currently chair of the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission. Um, we were here a month ago, and at the time I thought I wasn't coming back quite so soon, but I'm here again. And I needed to kind of go over some issues that have developed. First of all, after that meeting, I was under the assumption that we would begin to implement um, our parks and recreation agendas and, and begin the process of meeting. Um, we did not receive notices of our meetings to be on last Monday. When I called Matt with the Public Works Department, he indicated that because we did not have a quorum, we would not be meeting. I also, at that point, then um, decided, well, I knew that some applicants had applied. And so today I called um, the board clerk's office and was asked about the process. At that point in time, she wasn't quite sure of the process, and she told me to call, talk to Kurt Code. Kurt came in the office at just shortly as I was talking. And um, I was then told, no, that that was being handled by Larry Combs. Uh, Larry Combs did return my call, and we did discuss briefly the process of appointing new commission members. There are two people that have applied. Uh, I was told that they would give the names to you and that you would look them over and then decide uh, whether or not they would be appointed. However, since the article in the paper about changing uh, our authority, uh, appointing any commission members is now on hold. How can we meet and discuss the issue of our authority when we can't meet because we don't have a quorum and you don't want to appoint anybody because you want to change the park's authority? Something's wrong here and I don't understand it. I am really confused. Um, I think it's Unfortunate, I don't understand why it's coming about the way it is. I have some ideas, but uh, I don't understand what we can do. How are we supposed to meet as just community members and deal with the issue and then come to the board? I don't know. I thought we were supposed to try and get members. Um, if I remember, Casey Kroon suggested we come to these meetings of the Public Works Committee. We were not informed about that meeting. Uh, either myself or Austin Smith, who was the other member, we were not told that that was even on the agenda. I read it in the paper. I don't think that's appropriate. I would like to know what we're supposed to do at this point in time. I also asked George at the last meeting about the safety on the entrance to Live Oak Park. He said he would respond to me. I have not heard from him. By the grapevine, I hear that you're not going to do anything. Uh, I don't like hearing by the grapevine. I don't think that's the way we should operate. I'd like to know what to do next. Well, Sharon, as far as the issue with the Public Works Committee that was on the agenda, um, staff brought the item to us in the Public Works Committee to look at the roles and responsibility of the Parks Commission um, based on the fact that we no longer have you know, the parks we've had with the annexations. Based on that information, uh, the committee said to bring it before the full board. Uh, those items, we didn't, we didn't make any changes to the recommendations or something like that. Bring it to the full board once we had applicants bring for the board so the board can look at the proposed changes to the commission itself 
and the applicants if, in fact, we're going to have a Parks and Recs Commission. That's where we're at with it. It was not something that was, you know, we didn't ask the Parks Commission to come up with recommendations. Um, and we're not seeking direction from the Parks Commission on these changes, these administrative changes that Obviously, staff is no. using and looking at and that the board is looking at. You know, the commission is advisory to the board. It doesn't mean that, that, you know, everything that's done is going to be taken to the commission for, to be acted upon. Secondly, the commission cannot act on anything. You do not have a quorum. You cannot sit and, and make recommendations to this board of supervisors with two members. But you're not willing at this point in time to appoint two members so that we can come with some ideas to share. And to me, I was told at the last meeting, or the meeting about the middle of April, that we need to come to these public works committees and kind of share information and let you know what's going on. We would expect the same in return. That, that is I true. I think that's not appropriate. Sharon, when, when you have a, when, when the commission can act as a commission, and you can't do that with two members, okay, then you will be notified, you can come, when we have items from the Parks and Recs Commission, you'll, you'll be notified to come to the commission. Otherwise, you're, you, you are like any other public member of the, of the public. You can show up to the meetings anytime you want. We do not notice, we do not send letters out to individual members of the community at large to come to our public works meeting. They're posted in the paper when our meetings are. I mean, th we're not trying to hide anything or do anything behind your back. You two commissioners cannot get together and act as a commission with two members. Now, if there I are- I don't think you're listening to me, Dennis. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't agree with you. You're not listening to what I have to say. Mr. Larson, can, the, can this commission meet and act with only two members? They do not have a quorum. That's the question at, at large, I believe. It's not possible for them to act as a committee if they do not have a quorum. Well, we have two, uh, as I understand it, we have two applicants for the uh, commission, two applications? Yes, I have their names. Um, obviously not for mine, since Sharon represents my district. I've not been notified or told we have two applicants. I don't believe I... Nobody's contacted me saying there's two applicants. Larry so. Combs knows there is because I talked to him today. Mr. Chairman, I was informed by the clerk that the routine is for the board members to receive copies of applications that are filed. And I believe Mr. Silva told me today he had received copies of those applications. <coughs> Excuse me. I assume the rest of the board members received those. I, but I don't know that. It is a routine process in the clerk's office. Well, we normally get the ones that are in your applying district. from in our district. district. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I have not received them. I, I thought, Mr. Silver, I thought you told me you would receive I both have, of them. I have one of them. You have one an of them. An individual okay. in my district. Okay. There was another one uh, in the third district, I believe, so Mr. Munger would have received that one. But, you know, even though that parks was something else. We're, yeah. we're in the Public Works Committee, we were so sensitive to the topic that the topic wasn't even discussed we didn't even go into the agenda item it was merely sent on to the full board when the what what do you mean the staff report that dealt with the organization or the things that the parks and rec commission would be responsible for we did not even discuss it we sent it straight on to the full board without recommendation you didn't discuss it even though the newspaper indicated that you talked about it? I, I can't remember the article word by word. Um, I think we said a couple of brief comments and sent it on. Yeah. Is it coming you did indicate board? that you needed more time to review the proposal. That's and true. That, uh, you briefly discussed the changes Thursday but, but took no action. I assume the newspaper is correct in their reporting. I could be wrong. Well, brief is that's exactly what it was. It came before us. We did not get our agendas until the day before, the afternoon before. Neither Casey and I had reviewed that staff report. And we do not act on anything, or at least I do not act on anything I've not reviewed. And so I said the one thing, is I'd like to have more time to look at it. I wasn't going to about to take action at a committee level. And then secondly, because it is a sensitive item, that the full board is going to make the decision anyway. I understand that. So we said bring it back to the full board when we have 
applications to bring to the board. We'll bring the applications to the board and we'll bring the staff report to the board so they can look at the applications. If the, if the board of supervisors is going to make the appointments and have a park and rec commission and before us at the same night, we'll also have the proposed changes that staff is recommending as far as what the new park and rec commission will look like as far as dealing with the issues we'll have since we no longer have the park system that has been annexed to the city. It'll be discussed at the same meeting. I was told that since the commission authority is being reviewed and possible changes, that then you would inform the two people who have applied that these are the changes. You will not appoint them based upon their application at this point in time. I don't have an appointment to make, so. Well, I just don't know what we can do about, you know, trying to, to facilitate this process and get things straightened out because we aren't able to. We, we've got two people who are willing to serve and they're not being appointed. My and comment I thought the under, my understanding was when we found these two people, then they would be appointed. Well, you're, you're okay, Sharon, from that stand, understanding, your understanding is incorrect. First of all, we can't make appointments, I believe, until the time period there's a, where the applications close, the notice closes on all of our, what's that process? In other words, we post them for a while, advertise, <laughs> and then, then they, that process closes, then the board can make the pro appropriate appointments. There is a process and there is a notice deadline, if you will. The appointment time frame on that has run. It's a statutory time frame that notices must be posted. So, so the appointments can be made any time after that time period. And that time I know has that run. That time run. has run. And typically what happens there, Sharon, is that when a supervisor is ready to make an appointment, they'll ask for that to be agendized so that those applications will come from the board to the full board and if it's a member from Mr. Silva's district or my district or Casey's districts then historically and traditionally out of respect to the board members we make those appointments out of our own districts. When it was put in the paper there was no deadline for application. Is there a deadline for application? I don't think so. Uh, perhaps you're misunderstanding. Uh, the okay. statute requires that notices be posted for I believe it's 10 days so that statutory deadline has run the only deadline after that is when an appointment is made so we have several uh, committee and commission appointments in the county where there are vacancies the commission is one of them where deadlines have run uh, we probably noticed the commission two or three times I would guess and I'll speak for myself because what happens if I'm pointing somebody out of the second district to a commission or a board, I will contact the applicants that I have, usually set up a meeting with them, discuss their application, and then I'm ready to then to request that item be placed on the agenda so I can act and have my fellow board members act on it. That's the process that is traditionally we go through, and at least what I do personally as, as a board member when I'm going to make an appointment. I contact the applicants. I want to know who they are and why they want to serve for whatever it is. And the other board members can speak to what are process that they use. And however, however time, much time that takes to do, that's what it happens before it gets agendized on the board of supervisors calendar. That's where we're at. I assume Mr. Silva has a, a process in mind. Well, the process in mind would be that I would not apply, I would not uh, put a person in that position not knowing of the new facts and figures that would be appropriate for, for the commission to address. I wouldn't want to put that individual in my district in that position and have he or she read uh, the terms and conditions of, of a, a committee and them not be applicable to that applicant at that time. And I know Public Works has that plan in mind to put together a criteria for the new Parks and Recs Commission and then at that point in time when I know that criteria I would have valid information to disseminate to my my candidate. What do you mean by when you say criteria? Are you talking uh, about serving public, public or? Public Works is building new criteria for, for, for you. The implementation of the pro direct you and what to do. So that new criteria that Public Works will direct to the board that will be new criteria based on what we think the Parks and Recreation uh, Committee is to provide for services back to the board, that criteria then I would present that on to my candidate and ask her if that would work, if that works for her, 
and, and would or him. not or him and not give them a false intent at that time to read the criteria that exists now for the Parks and Rec Commission. Do you know when that's going to come to the board? Casey? No. I, I, want to make I sure also I have had a excuse me a minute. Yeah, I, I want ahead. to I'm not sure I understand something that's going on here. Staff is going to be making recommendations to the full board to change the county ordinance regarding the Parks Commission. Is that what's happening? That's correct. When did we decide we were changing it? I didn't know we had ever even discussed changing it. Or is that just a staff recommendation that's going to come to that's us? That's a recommendation <coughs> from staff based on the discussions we had the fact that one, we don't have a standing committee, and then two, the makeup of what the Parks and Rec Commission used to do has changed because we've given up park systems in to the city of Yuba City. So, I don't remember any discussion being that we were changing, changing county ordinances to, as regarding the Parks Commission. I, I don't it hasn't come to the board yet, Joan. Well, I know that, but I didn't even know we were considering that. Well, I think we sent it to the committee after that one meeting mm -hmm. uh, is what happened. We talked about it, and things, that, things have changed. And, and we kind of directed the committee to take it, look, overlook it, and check out, check over the regs and over what their functions are. So what Dan is talking about then is that the um, staff is going to be coming to us with recommendations for changes to be made to the county ordinance regarding the Parks and Recreation Commission and their responsibilities and whatever they do. There's quite a section on that, by the way. Yes, there is. Um, and then, and then what you're saying is you don't want to appoint. Someone, Someone under false pretenses, correct. Until that's before us. So when is that coming before us? Come before the same time. We were... Well, I mean, staff ready? To, are they have the recommendation? I'm not sure where it's at. Supervisor Crone, a uh, couple of items. Uh, one, this has gone into a rather extensive discussion for something that is not agendized, and I'm, you, your board is well familiar with the Brown Act on that issue. Uh, you may want to agendize it for next week or you may wish to um, answer a couple of questions or direct staff to answer a couple of questions but uh, well, I want one question answered are they ready and when are they coming and when are we going to be dealing with this so that we can give I, an answer I mean my commissioner who has been a loyal commissioner is looking for some answers and I think that she deserves that I, I think the committee the public works committee needs to determine whether or not they wish that matter back in front of them for consideration if they don't it can be brought I on thought the board. Mr. The chairman just said that the Public Works Committee felt it was such a sensitive item that they were passing it on to the board. That's what they decided. Did I misunderstand you at your last Public Works Committee you decided to? Well, we didn't have really an adequate time to actually look at it but I feel that way right now. I mean as far as I'm concerned it could totally bypass the committee and just come directly here. Uh, but we also have gone on, or it was mentioned that one of the things that Mr. Munger had said, we'll give this 60 days, and so we're looking at that as part of, part of that deadline. So we wanted to get this done before the 60 days has run. 60 days to appoint people or 60 days for the... He wanted to see in 60 order. days to see what kind of what number of people have actually oh, after, after after applied and so on. So when Sharon asked what's the time frame, then there were 60 days from the time that she attended the last meeting, or 60 days... I'm just trying to get some answers. Well, in, in essence, there again, it was nothing that the board voted on. I mean, in other words, that was we're trying to adhere to the wishes of Mr. Munger, trying to hear to we, okay. your wishes. Mr. Munger, what 60 days from when? 60 days from that that particular meeting. That we will. That's when we will close applications, or we will consider whatever applications are there. Okay. And then, uh, staff, uh, when are they going to be coming forward with these recommendations for changes? Uh, on a staff level, we're ready to go, Madam, as far as that, back to whenever the board yeah. wishes. Basically, what we said is when we get the applicants, we were not aware of, I was not aware of we had any applications turned in. Yeah, I wasn't either. All right. So we said when we, get the, when we get the applications and they're ready to come to the board, we'll bring this revision to the ordinance to the board okay, at the same time. This is the first anybody. time we heard that. So we can bring the, the, the revised ordinance prior to that, if that's what Dan wishes to do. Staff, bring the revised ordinance to the next meeting. We, we will bring it to you in the next meeting. It's easy. I, I, don't, I don't know if we have to hold the hearing on it, but we can, we, we'll agendize some, something for your board next week. Could I ask when the next meeting is? A week from today? I'm sorry? A week from today? 
uh, we need to work with county council and that we'll, we'll try, we'll, we'll shoot for next week. Okay, if well, not. We do it two weeks just to be sure that okay. we have time. I think time certain is what Sharon's looking for, um, I think, so she knows what to tell people. Now, when, when you are going to amend a county ordinance, maybe I should ask council this, um, what's the procedure for that? The ordinance is introduced, and then uh, five days or more later, it's adopted, if that's the board's action. So if, if, if staff brings their recommendations in two weeks to the meeting, that's introducing it? If the board wishes to, yes. Okay. And if the board takes action five days later, that would be It's the... adopted and effective 30 days after that. Thank you. You're welcome. 30 days after. An ordinance is effective 30 days after it's okay. adopted, unless it's Thank an urgency you. enactment. Thank you. Question then, could Parks and Rec Board act upon, if they have a quorum to have a meeting to act upon items that would be of a necessity to their board's action? If, they, if there's a quorum, Daryl, if, if, if we adopt this, then can the, and if there is a quorum after that, can that board meet prior to that 30 days and make decisions that are valid? Yes. I just have two comments. One, I do have another commission, a uh, poten potential commission member, who's very um, on the fence now because of the things that have appeared in the paper. And I think that's unfortunate. And secondly, uh, we're talking about changing the uh, responsibilities of the Parks Commission. However, you just received $287,000 designated for Parks and Recreation. Thank you. I think we knew that. Are there any other comments by members of the public? Okay, then we'll go on to the consent calendar, which are items 2 through 13. Second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Carries unanimously. Appearance items. Uh, first one is a hearing on denial of a lot line adjustment. And uh, turn this over to Dale Fallis. Good evening. We have uh, a request for an appeal of a lot line adjustment that was de denied by the Community Services Department. If you recall at the last meeting, we had the Teresh Certificate of Compliance before you. This is a somewhat similar application in that the parcel that uh, one of the parcels involved in the application was a parcel which Caltrans acquired a portion of the property of a subdivided lot uh, from for purposes of right of way for Highway 113. In doing so, the remainder of the parcel that was left after that portion was taken by Caltrans or acquired by uh, Caltrans, that portion became a non-legal parcel at that point in time. Staff received the application for two lots or two parcels to do a lot line adjustment. We denied the application based on the fact that we did not have two legal parcels. Staff's recommendation tonight to your board is one, approve the appeal and direct staff to continue processing the lot line adjustment. Two. The second is to authorize staff to record a non-conditional certificate of compliance on that parcel that Caltrans acquired the right-of-way for. In doing that, we'll have the two parcels. The reason for the uh, continued compliant or continue processing of the lot line adjustment is that when staff determined there were not two legal parcels, we stopped processing. The environmental Health Division and the Public Works Department has not seen the, uh, the lot line adjustment by your board directing staff to continue processing will then send it on to environmental health and to public works they'll have their opportunity to review it for compliance with ordinances and if it complies with ordinances then we can approve it dale a question you say two legal parcels why why are there two when only one was severed by this well, in order to do a lot line adjustment you generally have to have two parcels to change the boundary between and one of them 
was a legal parcel. It was determined to be a, large, a legal parcel. It was the same parcel that was part of a parcel map that was several years ago. I'm not sure of the date of that parcel map. The second parcel of that was the one which Caltrans acquired the additional right away from, and that it's that parcel which is the non-legal parcel. Dale, I have a question for you. First of all, you know, the outcome of this thing I don't have a problem with. I think that, that there are two parcels down there that should have lot line adjustment. No, no said, but I, I, the process, I have a little bit of problem with the process. Why wouldn't we in this situation, uh, it looks like that we're authorizing or we're initiating the certificate of compliance, the county's initiating the certificate of compliance, is that what we're doing? You're authorizing staff to prepare one and record one, yes. Okay, why wouldn't we, and I'm going back to other things we've done where planning has brought items to us and says, okay, if you're going to approve this thing, then approve it with the condition of getting these things done. Why wouldn't it be appropriate to say, okay, approve the lot line just in a contention of the applicant uh, getting the certificate of compliance. Why, why in this situation are we doing the certificate and not asking the applicant to do the certificate? Well, one staff that used this opportunity to bring this whole issue before the board, we have had some inquiries over the past several months on these parcels with the right of way acquired by the state. So we chose to, to recommend to the applicant to do the appeal of the, uh, the lot line adjustment. We're taking the opportunity to bring up the whole issue of what is the process of how to resolve this issue. What staff is recommending is basically in a public forum is saying we're suggesting that we file, file a certificate of compliance on all applications from this point forward and then if you want to do a lot line adjustment after the parcel is determined to be a legal parcel pursuant to the subdivision map act pursuant to our own subdivision ordinance then you go ahead and do your lot line adjustment so you're asking the, for policy direction basically along with we're this. using uh, this as a policy that, direction. i think that's important because i don't know if the board understands that that that's what you're also in essence asking for is the, policy direction and you're talking about in these situations where you have a another agency the state in this case coming in and acquiring right away in other words under those conditions you want to be able to have this process in place we want to make it clear to the public that there is a process in place. It's spelled out in the subdivision map act in our own ordinances, and the board has discussed this and said this is the policy we're going to be using, and this is the way we're going to. Okay. Well, I understand the applicant's attorney, I believe, disagrees or has a different opinion as to the process, and I, I believe that's in contrary to what Mr. Larson has indicated to us is what the process is. And, I think that should at least be brought out this evening and discussed so the board understands that at least there's two different mindsets of two, two legal opinions to what's correct so the board can at least make a determination in our mind what the, which way we want to go. And I'll, Dale, if you want to do that, or Mr. Larson, if you understand uh, the, I guess, the, the other side of the coin, so to speak, from the applicant's attorney he has a different thought as to another law or something. and. I think that's important for the board to understand, at least there's another thought process out there. I think I well, I'll attempt to respond. If you would, please. Um, I've read the uh, submission on behalf of the applicant. It doesn't indicate that it's from a lawyer. It indicates okay. that it's from Mr. Oji. Um, our analysis is that uh, in order to perform a lot line adjustment, the statute says you have to have two lots. You're making an adjustment between two lots. Those have to be legally existing lots. In a circumstance where a public entity receives a conveyance, uh, that conveyance to the public entity is exempt from the requirements of the Subdivision Map Act. That is what has happened to date with regard to Caltrans acquisitions of right-of-way. They get a small strip of land from the property owner and they don't have to go, that is Caltrans, or the entire transaction doesn't have to be done in conformance with the MAP Act. The result is that there's something left over, and that something isn't the subject of a conveyance. It's not described anywhere. It doesn't have an existence in the county records. And as a consequence, based on Attorney General's opinion and the opinions of our office for something like 15 years, we don't believe that it's a legal lot and can't be the subject of a lot line adjustment. And what staff is suggesting is one way to address that, a way that's available or a mechanism available to everybody in the community. If they have a lot that they have a question about with regard to 
its legal status, they can ask for a certificate of compliance and one has to be issued by the public entity, either conditional or non-conditional. And the proposed solution here is that this non-recognized remainder be the subject of a certificate of compliance that the board say that, it, that the board can give it existence, legal existence. And that's what the proposal is, and apparently the staff is suggesting that that be the proposal for these kinds of circumstances in the future as well. Once that legal status is established, then you have the two lots that are necessary in order to accomplish the desired lot line adjustment. Opposing view is that um, the thing that's left over hasn't gone anywhere. It's still on the ground out there, uh, and it makes sense that the legislature should have understood that and the law should recognize it. The problem in our view with that analysis is that's an excellent statement of what the law should be. I guess then I, I have a further question. If the lot line adjustment were to be recognized by this board, and I, I know where you're coming from that you can't lot line adjust a lot that's not there. But if, if there's actually a description of the actual lots and it's also a mysterious act for us to be able to allow those two lots to be changed or adjusted and we then recognize those lines, is that not doing the same thing if, given the validity or given that particular lot validity which it didn't have before? I don't think you can give the lot validity through approving a lot line adjustment. You can give the lot validity by the means that's given to you by the legislature, which, which is to issue a certificate of compliance. If you simply approve the lot line adjustment, then it's a statement on your part that you believe the law is consistent with what is set forth in Mr. O.G.'s letter. Okay. Okay, are there any further questions? Uh, <clears throat> Daryl, as, as a landowner, can I require the state to, in the transaction of the real estate purchase, provide a conveyance for me to make me whole when that transaction is done? Yes. What, Why do they th not th have You to would not be meeting tonight if Caltrans had acquired both parcels and reconveyed the remainder to Mr. Oji. And neither one of those transactions would have had to comply with the MAP Act. <clears throat> What makes them exempt from that MAP Act? Statute. The legislature has said that they are, as so you are. I feel we as a county ought to publicly address some way to tell all landowners to not convey property to the state of California without a conveyance and compliance. I convey $25 worth of property to the state of California for a right-of-way, and it turns around and costs me $1,000 to get that conveyance across. That's a total misrepresentation on my part from the states acquiring my property. I mean, they don't make me whole when that's done. Again, they could if they wished. Don Coyote comes to play here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is your pleasure? Mr. Chairperson? Yes, sir. We have Mr. Walker in the audience. They may have something to say on this. He, Mr. Walker representing. I don't think anyone's opposing. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Bill Walker, and I'm with Von Geldern Engineering, and the address is 430 2nd Street. Um, I think what is at issue here is that we disagree with the idea that when Caltrans purchases a piece of property, the remainder portion that's left over, which would be still owned by the by the landowner is is, is illegal um, if you were to well for one thing the state of California doesn't think that so, so someone has to be wrong if you talk to the state of California and I've talked at least locally to the right-of-way department Sutter County is the only place in the state that they're aware of that would not recognize these remainder parcels that were left over as a result of their 
acquisition of some right of way that uh, the, the, the Sutter County would be the only one that does only county that they're aware of that does not recognize those as still legal whole uh, whole parcels um, to think that you could require Caltrans I guess you wouldn't require Caltrans you could say you could tell those owners of those properties who are selling rights of way to Caltrans that uh, don't don't sell to Caltrans unless you m make them get you a certificate of compliance. Well, it's it's for one thing they cost a thousand dollars and they take a couple of months to get. But beyond that, not just the cost and the time that it takes. Um, the, the a certificate of compliance is a discretionary. It, it's true that you must grant a certificate of compliance if it's requested but it can be a conditional certificate of compliance. You can impose conditions on it. And I would assume if that's the case, you can impose whatever conditions you want. There is wording in the MAP Act that would, if a piece of property that was created illegally and is sold, and if a subsequent purchaser comes in and buys property, then the county has the right to impose conditions with a certificate of compliance that would require that now owner to bring or, or would it would give the county the right to impose conditions that they could have imposed at the time that the illegal act was made supposedly this illegal act is the splitting of the property and leaving the owner with an illegal parcel um, if the owner the current owner is the person in this case mr. OG if he were the, and he is the owner, he was the owner at the time he sold to Caltrans, so that was the time the illegal act was made. I, I don't believe it's an illegal act, but if that's, if the county says that's when the illegal act was made, and he was the owner at the time that it was made, and he is still the owner today, when he requests a certificate of compliance, you have the power to impose upon him conditions that you could impose on a parcel split if it were being applied for today. Now. Caltrans is not going to come to the County of Sutter on discretionary issues. They're not going to come with their hat in their hand and ask Sutter County, gee, could you please give us favorable conditions? Uh, don't impose too much on us. We'd like to get a little road widening here. They're just simply not going to do that. And I'm being told that they don't do that anywhere else in the state and that Sutter County is the only place where they have been confronted with this. And I would think I would think that as representatives of the citizens of Sutter County that if this is to be held to, I would think you would want to warn the citizens of Sutter County, don't sell to Caltrans unless you fully understand the implications. In these types of situations, your land will become illegal. And then you have to go to the county and you have to ask for this certificate of compliance. It's not just oh it's a little processing paperwork and it is it's true you must grant a certificate of compliance but it also can contain conditions and an owner doesn't know what those conditions might be and you're free to impose whatever conditions you feel you would like to impose so to think that well let's let's warn them and tell them so that when Caltrans comes to buy this additional right-of-way that you must you should tell Caltrans go to Sutter County and get a certificate of compliance or I'm not going to sell to you. They, they simply aren't going to do that. Bill, a, uh, an easier way is the, the process that Mr. Falls is asking for, for from a policy standpoint is when these lot line adjustments come, come before the county, attached with that is a certificate so that if we are the only county in the state of California, which I can't believe we are, it, it, I don't believe that somebody from Caltrans didn't tell you that. I just can't believe we're the only only county in California that, that require this. But anyway, that is that they, aside. But they told me that. I know. I'm not saying. I'm saying I don't don't doubt you weren't told that. I just have a hard time believing that that's the truth. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, a better process to make sure that we're covered uh, from what our county council is interpreting the law is and the attorney general's opinion and those type of things is to do as, as Dale says is attach that certificate non-conditional certificate is that that's what Dale's asking for so in these situations that's true we have it the lot line adjustment is done we we've a, we have the certificate of compliance it's non-conditional therefore conditions shall not be set upon it we're happy Mr. Larson's happy 
So the county is from our side, and your client, whether it's Mr. OG or anybody else, has his lot line adjustment. That's true. And on behalf of Mr. OG, if that's what you're going to give us, that's what we would be happy with getting. And I am assuming since this issue was brought about in the there were two agenda reports one was recommending the waiver of the one thousand dollar application fee are you still considering that uh, mr chairman if i might clarify for the board um, you do have a separate discussion item on this uh, where they're uh, asking for some policy direction but your board will be presented separately an action item to direct to give policy to staff on it and uh, if you wish you can delegate to staff the authority to do these conditional uh, or um, I'm sorry certificates of compliance non-conditional as a as a matter of course when somebody applies for a lot line adjustment and this is the circumstance so that staff has the ability to simply process it and there's no problem for the landowner and I had not intended to get into this discussion on Mr. OG's issue we see the conditions we're certainly in agreement with those Again, I'm asking the question, is it your intention to waive the $1,000 filing fee for the Certificate of Compliance? You had, well, <laughs> there's five of us. Pardon? <laughs> there's five of us here. We can't all answer Mr. at Mr. Chairman, once. that's your next agenda item. I know. It's our next agenda item. Answer that the, next agenda. the reason I bring it up, we have two agenda reports. The first agenda report suggested that, that it suggested, and that's why I'm asking. Because if we leave here and you don't address that issue, I suspect Mr. OG will be paying you $1,000. And if we. I would suggest that you stick, it, maybe you, you stick around for the next agenda item, and I think you'll be very happy. Stand by. Pardon? Stand, Stand by. I, I, I think the outcome will be very favorable. Thank you. Mr. Larson, do you have a written opinion from the Attorney General? There is an uh, Attorney General's opinion that our analysis is based on. It isn't. It has to do with remainder lots. It isn't specific to right-of-way acquisition by Caltrans. Oh, okay. I was going to say, if we had something real specific, I'd like you to provide a copy. I can provide a copy of the, of the Attorney General's opinion to which I referred, but again, it's not specific to right-of-way acquisition. Would you like that? Thank you. Okay, what's your pleasure? Um, I'll move that uh, we approve the appeal and uh, continue and have staff con continue processing the original application. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to get this down. Um, let's see, you, ne you need us to approve the appeal. Do you need more than that? Uh, Items number motion? one and two on the record. Authorize staff to record non-conditional certificate of compliance. Oh, approve and appeal and direct staff to continue processing line, lot line adjustment number 01-11 and authorize staff to proceed to record a non-conditional certificate of compliance for Sutter County Assessor's Parcels number 25-050-042. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, carries unanimously. And just item number 15, which is the discussion of possible action regarding the adjustment in fees paid by recent applicants of certificates of compliance and direction or amending the fee resolution. This is the item we asked to be on for this week, last week, correct? Good evening, yes. Um, you might recall that back in 1999 when we were presenting to you the community services fees that you did have a question about the cost of certificates of compliance. And we went back and, and uh, studied it other counties and we came back to you with an explanation which we reiterated in the first paragraph here. And ultimately you went along with it. Now, um, last week we had an issue come before us on, on certificates of compliance and you recognized that it wasn't as complex in that situation as the normal certificate of compliance would have been. And so um, you asked us to go back and, and figure out what the costs were for that specific one. And uh, for the Mr. Uh, Terrish's Certificate of Compliance, uh, staff went back and reviewed their time and, and um, it cost us approximately $560. And um, so um, on the current one that we just looked at, Mr. Oji's item, um, in his case, he has um, um, submitted 
funds to the county uh, in the amount of $650. And what we have proposed to do for his is that we would um, um, take that $650 that he has presented as an at cost uh, figure and then from there whatever the remaining amount of time we'd have to spend is then we would figure out that cost and um, If it wasn't the six hundred and fifty dollars We would refund to him the amount and if it was a little bit more then we would request the difference So it would be just like an, an at cost deposit uh, with us actually looking at our time um, And so that is our recommendation to you on those two certificates of compliance Let me ask you something what we've just um... <clears throat> Approved in item 14. This is just going to be uh, staff is is going to be automatically doing these. What, what's going to be the the staff time and cost in this? Um, I don't know how much time would be involved. Maybe Tom could address how much time, much more would be involved in doing that. You're just going to issue the certificate of compliance. We're going to have to get an application for the certificate from from the applicant. They're going to apply for that and then we will process their application under this fee. Um, well, but what's processing? What, what's involved in that? Well, typically it goes to the Board of Supervisors. In this case, we're not, we're in, in this case, we would not be going to the board, so there's right. much less time involved. It may be, um, you know, we've already done a lot of the work through the lot line adjustment, so we may have a couple more hours of work left to process both the lot line adjustment and the certificate. But then we need to sit down and figure out what our time has been spent to date and the time in issuing the non-conditional certificate of compliance can be about zero since that's no, what you're required there's time, to There's do. time spent and we have to write up the certificate, we have to process it, we have to take it through the recorder's office. There's, there's a lot of little steps that we do to, I mean, there's a, probably a couple hours worth of work preparing it, putting it together, processing it. $560 worth of, worth of work to issue the, a certificate of compliance? Well, you're talking about last week's, the other, the Terrace I'm application. I'm talking about, what is it going to be? We've now set up well, a process that's just going to be, goes to staff, doesn't come to the board. We're, we're dealing with two different projects here. One is a lot line adjustment for OG. It's a completely different project from the certificate of compliance with you, which you, with, with, which you heard last week. That project for Terrace we estimated to be $560 based on our time spent processing it to that time as of going to the board last T week. Tom, what does that equate to as far as hours, roughly? I don't, because I don't know what you're using for a rate, but what would you say hour-wise that might be a little better? An hour and a half of yours. You know, it was about six and a half hours of Dale's time and an hour and a half or so of my time. Yeah, that's okay. process, again, doing a complete right, process. Right, no, that's what I'm asking for. So you're talking about... Going to the board, going to the committee, yeah. doing staff reports. And so on. That was about eight, about eight, eight hours worth of work, roughly, yeah. as, a, as, a, as an estimate, you know, to process that and get to the board. Where the one with Mr. OG is. That was a pretty straightforward, just because right. that was a pretty straightforward uh, project. It was just there was some, the issue had to deal with the legality of it. Right. And, 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 and the one we're talking about with yeah, Mr. OG, since you've done a lot line adjustments, you have that information and that so it's a fairly simple review now of of the certificate portion so you're estimating one or two hours possibly Extra, what we've at, spent at so far most. yeah we've, we've done most of the work already for 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 og because we've as far as our work on on the uh um reviewing the lot line adjustment application processing the certificate in conjunction with that is going to be very little time it's just a matter of doing all the technical steps to prepare the certificate and just process that, which is at the most a couple hours. I guess what I'm getting at, since we, what we just passed in the certificate, the steps for that are going to be the same for everybody, not counting the lot line adjustment, just issuing this non-conditional certificate. I mean, that should be a flat rate, shouldn't it? That's what I'm trying to get at. Well, the, the, steps, the steps as far as the recordation of it is, Joan, but as far as the research behind it, I, I think Dale can probably explain much better as to what you get involved with when you have to do the research, if it's complicated than that, uh, to research it out to, to come up with the certificate itself. In other words, it can be very straightforward and it can take no time at all processing like lot line adjustment or it can be quite in-depth as far as going back doing the research on it which is going to be time in intensive so, so it has to be at an at rate cost 
I don't think. Otherwise, we'll get right back to what we're doing now. You know, we set a year ago, two years ago, we set a thousand dollars. Realize now, on an average, it's not costing us a thousand dollars. We want to adjust that. Now we can set it too low, and all of a sudden, it starts costing the county money. So, you know, the process would be is to set it at at, at charge cost. In other words, whatever it takes to do the, the certificate. Supervisor Bechtel and uh, Supervisor Nelson, one of the other factors that's noted in the staff report that I want to make sure the board is aware of is that your board sets costs for items that are processed by the county based on a staff recommendation of the average number of hours that item takes to process. And as the staff report notes, other counties process certificates of compliance in a fairly routine fashion. The Board of Supervisors is not involved. When the Board of Supervisors in Sutter County is involved, that means staff has to write a staff report that takes time that is charged to the applicant. Excuse me, Larry, but didn't we just, didn't we just pass the number 14 that the board's not going to be involved anymore? This no, you to... haven't yet. Uh, that's a separate item that will be brought to the board in the future. That's what I was telling you. Oh, okay. But other certificates of, of compliance, even if we bring this to you, on these types of certificate of compliance, they will be rather routine because staff will almost ministerially issue them for a Caltrans acquisition, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the next person that walks in with requesting a certificate of compliance, you're going to be back to your $1,000 fee. And your reason for that is because there is a process in Sutter County that involves the Board of Supervisors. That means staff is going to spend some amount of time doing the necessary research and writing the certificate of compliance, which is a fairly short amount of time compared to also you have to write staff reports. I don't know if this goes through the public, uh, public Works Committee. Appear before the Public Works Committee, report to them, amend the staff report, bring it to the Board of Supervisors if necessary, but it always comes to the Board. All of that time is charged to the applicant. The Board could choose to take a much more routine approach to certificates of compliance. That decision was made as a matter of policy years ago. But unless the board chooses to, if you will, take itself out of the certificate of compliance process and delegate that to staff totally uh, with some parameters, that's how you have to do it. Staff's going to have to charge for the amount of time that it takes to take it through committee, write the staff reports, and come to the Board of Supervisors. And that is charged to the applicant at the hourly rate the planning department charges out. But we can isolate out the certificates of compliance that are Caltrans related. Yes, and, and we will be bringing that my, we will be bringing that item to the board for action in the near future. I don't know how quickly that's coming. Yeah. Larry, at our last public works meeting, Mr. Bagley has, had, gives, had given us an information item on that, that they're working on, on that, uh, and we'll bring those new fee structures to us. And so we'll be looking, and that's one of the things we'll be doing, is taking out the certificate of compliances so they're not labor intensive on our side for these type of acts, so they can be handled and, and done in a much quicker and easier way. But I wanted to make sure changes. the board understood that this, that action will not remove, will not take all certificates of compliance and reduce them to very little cost. You still have your $1,000 charge for regular certificates of compliance unless the board chooses to change the process or change the fee. And that's one thing we will be looking at is having all certificates just be done by staff similar to lot line adjustments with an appeal process to the board which will reduce fee significantly. We'll look at that option uh, of, of having all certificates whether they're conditional or not conditional. Well. To, to time to do our research and and prepare an ordinance, a draft ordinance, and go through the committee. And we, I, we are I working on it now, so I, I imagine by next month sometime. With, with regard to the Caltrans item, I had a discussion with Mr. Hall today. Mm -hmm. I believe the ordinance is ready and should be coming forward fairly quickly. But with well, regard to all certificates of compliance, I think that's a separate issue and that would probably take additional research. Yeah. Actually, the, the, the Caltrans issue is not completely finished. It's been in draft form, and we, we need to work on it as far as being a little more specific with that option. But again, we're gonna, I think we're going to come back with two options. One, dealing with just having all certificates go through staff as, lot line, as a, similar to a lot line adjustment process. And the other? Okay, so what's before us basically is the applicant from last week and Mr. OG, and you're asking for direction. Correct. 
Mr. Chairman, if there's no further discussion on that, I would move that we direct staff to go back and look at the actual time involved with Mr. Terrish's certificate and Mr. Oji's and uh, charge those out at an actual at cost <coughs> amount. Second. Uh, question? With respect to last week's agenda item on Mr. Terrish, you said certificate. Was it certificate or certificates? Plural. Is Mr. Terrish charged individually certificates on each parcel? And with that $560, it's just 10 one. parcels, charge. but they were all the same. One charge. <clears throat> one application. Okay. Okay, I have a motion to second. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Carries unanimously. May I ask a question? Certainly. Uh-huh. Did you have something to add? Well, I certainly did. Well, what was that? I guess we want to hear it all. Well, I would, I would like to. I'm trying to be polite here. Well, would, uh, Mr. By Chairman, all means, you... come forward. There is a, a provision in the MAP Act that says if the county becomes aware that parcels have been created illegally, then they shall, by certified mail, send a letter to the property owner of this illegal parcel that you intend to file a notice of violation or I'm just wondering if you intend to do that. For one thing, that would be one way to notice. It wouldn't, have, wouldn't catch the first guy, but by the time you sent a few of those out, people would become aware that you better not sell any land to Caltrans unless you understand the implications. But, it, but isn't that as when we become aware of the fact we have an illegal parcel? Once you become aware of the fact that a parcel is, is illegal. Well, we won't know that until, like Mr. Oji, you file something with the county as far as a lot line adjustment or that. I mean, we're not checking well, Caltrans' records to find out what properties they've bought in Sutter County. Now that I've brought it to your attention, you will know that any time Caltrans buys a piece of property, then the remainder will be illegal. Oh. And you know that Caltrans has a program now, and they're going through the county, and they're buying up this property for highway widening and it's going to affect the citizens of the county. I'm not doing this on my behalf. The citizens of this county are going to be impacted. It's going to be a tremendous burden on all of them. They won't, they'll, they'll come in perhaps and try to get a building permit. They can't get a building permit for their land they thought was perfectly legal. They can't get it because now the property, as soon as the planning department or the building department takes a look at it and sees, oh, Caltrans took a sliver, then this is illegal. So I just wanted to point out, and, and, and the reason I'm doing so is that it, perhaps this is a way to begin noticing the people of Sutter County. And then this, there's a provision in the Subdivision Map Act uh, that says whenever a local agency has knowledge that real property has, has been divided in violation of the provisions of this division or of local ordinances enacted pursuant to, it shall cause to be mailed by certified mail to the then current owner of record of the property and notice of intention to record a notice of violation. So if you would do that, at least it would at least it would begin to put people, by the time you did a few of those, people it would become aware that I should not be doing this unless I fully understand the implications. And I I know everyone thinks that, well just tell Caltrans to, you know, when you sell, when you're negotiating with Caltrans, tell them you want a certificate of compliance. All you have to do is to go, or I'm not going to sell my property to you unless you guarantee me this certificate of compliance. And all you have to do is go to the county and they'll give you one. That's not true. The county, that may be true, you may choose to just grant them, but as we're finding out, they cost $1,000. It's my experience, they take a couple of months to get through. But um, you have the power, other boards, other people at other time, you have the power to impose conditions on those certificates of compliance. You may choose to, to not do that in this example, or the next 10, but whenever there's another board or other people involved, they may choose to say, we want some conditions. We want you to put some curbs in there, Mr. Caltrans. You know they're not going to do that, and they don't do that throughout the state. The system falls apart if you rely on this interpretation. Mr. Combs, I mean, we do know that Caltrans will be buying property to widen Highway 99. What would you suggest how we handle this? 
It's my understanding, uh, and let me ask quickly, George, are you in discussion with Caltrans on this? We were waiting to, to, to get direction from your board. We, re we, we became aware that your board will be discussing this issue tonight. And, um, you know, before that, we didn't know if your board is going to go on and determine that these are illegal parcels and you're going to require a certificate of compliance. But we know tonight that that's your determination, and from here we will proceed dealing with Caltrans. Okay, we made contacts with staff, and on a, sta on a lower staff level, they do not agree with us on that. So we were planning to go on the higher level. So how, how are we going to, to protect our citizens through this? If, I mean, we're, I, staff, can, I know you, I'm not expecting an answer today, but can we look at that? And yes, we need to look at that. Uh, Mr. Walker's brought something to our attention that at yeah. least I was not familiar with. I'm sure staff has some knowledge of that. George, the property that Caltrain acquires, like in this case from Mr. Oji, the piece of, of ground they acquired for the right-of-way, uh, is that recorded in a rec as, as you and I would record uh, uh, a split of a parcel normally? How, what's the process Caltrain goes through as far as uh, recording uh, that easement or that, that property they've acquired? They basically recorded deed, uh, deeding the, that strip of land from Mr. Oji to Caltrans, and Caltrans would record that deed. Okay. So it's a recorded document. It is a recorded document, right? Like any other any other division of land like that is. That's correct. Yeah. It's recorded here in Sutter County and at our clerk's office. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then then <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask the stupid question here. If that's recorded then isn't the piece that's left over still a legal parcel if that has the description and everything else? You know, the, the unfortunate thing is that Caltrans will worry about recording the property they're, they're acquiring, but I don't think, and in many cases, and, and Bill can correct me on this, in many cases that the remainder of the property is not conveyed in it by deed till there is a sale or a change of ownership. Then, 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 then they will draw a deed on that. So couldn't Caltrans just as easily draw up the description not only what they now acquired as right away and, and also record what's left over? They, they can record that, but I don't think that will satisfy the, the requirement making it a legal parcel. Yes, it would. That was the point I made earlier. Caltrans can solve this problem by uh, having the property owner convey the entirety to Caltrans and Caltrans retain the strip and convey the remainder back to the property owner. Both of the, all of those conveyances, both to and from a public entity, are exempt from the MAP Act. I understand, but I think uh, Mr. Chairman's uh, question, and maybe I'm wrong, what you're, what you're suggesting that Caltrans would record a deed taking that strip of land of the, for, for their purposes, purpose uses, and then record a deed covering the remainder without going through the, 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 the motion of deeding it all to Caltrans and then Caltrans deeding it back to the property owner. Yeah, I didn't see a difference between what Supervisor Kroon suggested and what I said. In both cases, Caltrans comes up with a legal description not only for the strip they're acquiring but for the remainder. And both are recorded and, and are of record and are legal. I think, I think that's, uh, that's probably an easy way to solve this problem, is suggest to Caltrans well, to record two deeds when they, when they, when they acquire the land. Yeah, then there's no certificate of compliance involved at all. But we can't force Caltrans to do that. Exactly. But, but I don't see how that is that terribly difficult for them to do. Well, they have to work with a given description to begin with. Then they have to come up with a description of what they now have the right to put their property or, or their road on. It should be pretty simple with a little subtraction to come up with a description of the rest of it. I think you can easily describe the remainder. If you have one description of the strip that you're taking, it's easy to describe what's left. And that would solve our problem and all our citizens' problems. Is there some way... So then you'd let them take it eminent domain, then you just let them take it as eminent domain? And then you still have an illegal parcel. Sure you do. So the only reason I, can, can, I persist in this is because if I walk away and that's the end of it, people will come in, they'll pay $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, and one of these times down the line, some 
board is going to say, wait a minute, we have the power to impose some conditions here. Let's get some conditions from these guys. You have the power to do it. Mr. Chairman, yes, Mr. Mr. Combs. Is there a way that, that, that we could impose some kind of an ordinance when they, Caltrans comes to the clerk's office, when they buy that property, they have to do both? Or we would not accept it? In terms of um, any legal way, I'd have to defer to counsel, but it would be unlikely there would be any way we could impose a condition on the state of California. We are a, a subordinate agency to the state of California, and we are a creature of the state. Therefore, we don't have the ability to tell them what they can and can't do. Do they not have to record their belongings in our county? They do it pursuant to their law. <laughs> <laughs> You're playing by their rules. Well, uh, I thought Mr. Combs said that staff would come back and bring us a recommendation on this to so we staff can. is uh, it's referenced in the last paragraph here I believe you read that where we are preparing something we will bring it back to you and uh, as of the moment staff's recommendation is going to be that you delegate this authority to staff to resolve these Caltrans acquisitions <coughs> in a fairly ministerial fashion with no conditions since that's an that doesn't answer however Mr. Mr. Walker. Walker is correct that some future board could change the, change that excuse me well, that I don't think what you just said is answering his question is they still have to come in and, and get the certificate of compliance. But as I'm understanding the process, and Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, the process would be, let's say this recommended process had been adopted by the board and was in place. Mr. OG would have walked in with his lot line adjustment. It would have dis been discovered that, in fact, he doesn't have a legal lot because of this Caltrans issue, staff would have issued a um, certificate of compliance on the land with no conditions and processed lot line, lot line adjustment. That's the process we're anticipating. Am I correct, staff? I know that we're looking at a couple of different processes, but that would be in microphone. In, in, in general, that's the concept. The board has to make the policy decision, but in general, that's the concept. But I do want to reiterate, Mr. Walker is correct. A future board could change that process even if this board adopts that process. Well, I, I guess also what he is, his point is is that people um, sell their property to Caltrans. They don't know until they go to transfer their property again that they have this problem. And then I'm, that's why I'm wondering what it's going to cost them to correct this problem, which they never knew they had. It's going to cost them what we talked about this evening. It's going to be a, a, an actual at-cost charge to them, whatever that is. It's going to be something less than that $1,000. And, and, uh, it's and, going and to be I a think Mr. Walker's moment. point is this is going to be a cost that they're... They have no ideas coming yet. But the, no the, the noticing that Bill's talking about doesn't circumvent the, the certificate of compliance. It just puts you on notice today rather than two years from now or three years from now that you have a problem instead have, of county. Yeah, counting. that's right. All, all that does. So what Bill's talking about is a, is, a, is a statement out of the Subdivision Map Act that says, okay, you know, we know about the, the parcel. We're considering it illegal by, by our interpretation of, of law and Attorney General's opinion. And therefore, we'll, once Caltrans records at the clerk's office, we'll send the property owner a notice saying he has an illegal parcel. That's fine. That's what, that's what we're, gonna, we're talking we, about. We will address, and we will also address specifically the issue that we're dealing with today with Caltrans acquiring land in Sutter County to expand Highway 99. That's what's going on. Uh, that can be addressed. However, we cannot solve all future acquisitions by Caltrans because they go by a sliver of something here and a sliver of something there all the time. The county has no method of knowing when they're going to do that. We do know right now they're going to process some stuff on 99. We don't know what they're going to do on Highway 113, on Highway 20 the other places they might acquire right away. No, the county does know. Yeah, they do. I don't understand. That's what I understand, Larry. It, the county does. They have to record that as a deed. And but upon the recording... That's after the fact. Today, we Don't record it then. Call Caltrans and say you're out of compliance in the county. Uh, I, I think council will advise you and has advised you they aren't subject to the MAP Act. They aren't subject to your rules. The state makes up the rules Different for what rules. the state does. 
Well, the best we can do is, is do as Bill suggested as far as noticing the, the property owner. Dan, you sold Caltrans his property. Caltrans files their deed. We, get, we send you a letter saying, oh, by the way, you know, you're, you're out of compliance now with, with, the, with, the, with your remaining parcel. But again, that is after the fact. But that, that Today, is after the fact. we can, if we can't resolve this issue with Caltrans, we do have the ability to send every property owner along Highway 99 a letter saying, you should be aware of this problem we've run into. We don't have to wait to, for a problem to develop. What I'm suggesting, though, is we can't anticipate five years from now on Highway 113 or Highway 20. Those are going to be after the fact. And we're going to send Mr. Silva a letter and say, by the way, you sold this property, you have a problem. He's already gotten his $300 for the sliver of land they bought, and he may have to pay the whole $300 to the county assessor to process that. And, and the only other thing we do past that is, like say, keep the cost down by looking at the actual cost of uh, processing the certificate, making adjustments from a policy standpoint, making, you know, having staff handle it rather than coming to the board, cuts out the staff reports, and those things cuts the cost, the time down, cuts the cost down. So we can do those things from a board standpoint. And that's probably about the best we can do until, and, we, and if the state ever changes the law as far as recognizing these parcels. Well, when we send those letters and we use certificate of compliance and all of this, most homeowners will have no idea what you're talking about. I just think it's our duty. I think it's absolutely a duty of ours to inform our constituents well, that there is that. We will first try and solve this issue with Caltrans. Okay. Thank you. Again, I just so that my point is clear, I disagree with the interpretation. However, if the interpretation that the county has stands, I would think that it would be in the best interest of the citizens to somehow warn them. And we can warn them after the fact. Well, and warn them after the fact, at least one, if they're warned after the fact, by the time a few of them start getting these notices and saying, oh, by the way, I noticed you just, uh, the assessor picks these up, by the way. That's how the county knows. Every deed that gets recorded, county assessor picks that up and plots that in. And if it is, does not, if it's not uh, a piece of property that's been created by the appropriate processes, subdivision, parcel map, or lot line adjustment, uh, then uh, they know that because all of those, if it's a lot line adjustment, it states so right on the document. Any of those they see, they instantly know that it is illegal and they could notify whoever's going to send these letters out saying, by the way, your property is now le illegal and you can't do anything with it unless you come and pay us $1,000 and get it cleaned up. Uh, at least people will know. Bill, and that was my whole goal. It's not going to be $1,000. Well, I, I would feel negligent, that? really, as a citizen if I didn't make that an issue. And it just would be... Caltrans is in the process of purchasing thousands of pieces of property now. And we're, in not process of change, we're in the process of changing the cost of that. It's not going to be $1,000. It shouldn't. It should be zero. It shouldn't even be required. <laughs> and as soon as you become county council, we'll entertain that Thank you for your problem. time. I know I've taken a lot of it. <laughs> okay, our next item. Number 16 is the adoption of a resolution approving the Regional Waste Management Authority non-disposal facility element amendment. I've been thinking of a good transition for this, but I can't, so I'll just go on with the agenda item. The uh, Regional Waste Management Authority received a request from the Black Earth Composting Company to amend the regional non-disposal facility element to include their proposed composting facility in Yuba County. Under the current JPA, each entity now has to um, approve that and so I bring that to you to approve a resolution adopting the uh, RWMA non-disposal facility element amendment. Do you have any questions? I, I just have, where is Oakley Lane in County? You know, I'm not familiar Probably with it. 65 to the, there's an old milk plant down there just before you get to the South Beale entrance. Mm -hmm. Oakley Lane takes off and goes over to Red Hills on Wheatland and Rioso Road. Sure. So moved. For the discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Carries unanimously. That brings us to 720, Mr. Smith, item number 17, approval of the participation in grant application to California Employment Training Panel and approval of related letter of agreement with Yuba College. And don't blame me, Larry Munger said to put this off the consent calendar. <laughs> I think are, I asked are you for it to be off the consent. Cool, are you being cool this evening, or did, did you uh, lose your regular glass? Uh, hey, there you are. My glasses are somewhere. 
unfortunately, at my age, I'm having to, difficulty remembering exactly where I put them. Um, I'm asking this evening and recommending to you that you allow our department to participate in a grant with the uh, State of California Yuba Community College and Workforce Training Solutions. The concept here is that uh, Yuba Community College will apply for and we believe receive a grant from the Employment Training Panel, which is a state-funded uh, organization. Uh, the County of Sutter, through its agreement with Yuba College, will administer the grant. Uh, workforce Training Solutions will provide some of the uh, specialized training that is necessary. Um, as you know, I came to you some uh, weeks ago and we have leased a warehouse belonging to Sierra Gold Nurseries. Uh, and in that warehouse we've set up a, a, as best we can, a mock of the Cisco warehouse at Fremont. Cisco's provided us a couple of forklifts. The college has provided us some equipment. Our goal is that we will train potential employees of the Cisco Corporation so that they'll be ready to go to work when Cisco begins to hire and we'll have that opportunity. And we want to use these funds for that, specifically directed at individuals who have unemployment insurance claims in the state or who have exhausted their un unemployment insurance or who have been laid off. In addition to that, because we have the project set up and we have the uh, forklifts available from the college. We have been training for the last uh, two weeks, actually. We've done two classes, individuals uh, in our community so they can be certified for the safety provisions of forklift operation and know how to do that so they will be able to work in other uh, operations that use uh, forklift uh, functions. So I'm asking for your authorization to apply for the grant and to authorize me to sign the agreement as attached with Yuba Community College. This has been reviewed by their, your health committee and does come to the board with that committee's recommendation for approval. And, and along with that came, and, and they're also going to be training for uh, SunSuite and other companies are bringing people in there for forklift training on this too. So I, our, I thought it was a good project they started up. Thank you. Our first class was 19 individuals who received their certification and have are now more eligible for employment, et cetera. Uh, the second class was, I think, 20 individuals. We have another one that started uh, yesterday. So, Any further questions or comments? Actually, we did forklift training years ago, just under a different name, JTPA or one of those others, or CETA. Um, if you're not occupied this summer, we may have another spot for you if you want to. All right, did you mention this, all, that Cisco provided all the... The, they the have power. provided us racks and some of their forklifts. They will also provide us all of their, uh, the product needed. They have a very sophisticated sorting and selecting of product, and they will provide that uh, and some of the pallet jacks that we'll need to use to do that. Good. What's your pleasure? Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you very Very unanimously. Thanks, Mr. Ed. Chairman, uh, I want yes, to take a moment to note for uh, the board and the public that this is an excellent example of the kind of service that Sutter County and, and we've got some pretty innovative staff and Mr. Smith's department uh, provide to industry that wants to locate in Sutter County. Uh, this is a true, if you will, public-private partnership where we've gotten together with a very large corporation that wants to locate in Sutter County and as part of their process of locating here, we've set up something to train people that they want to hire our local residents who want to get jobs there. And uh, I'm pretty proud of our staff for doing that kind of work and coming up with those kinds of ideas so that companies feel welcome here, companies feel they're supported here, and we give opportunities to our citizens to get jobs and to be trained for the jobs, the good jobs that are available at these companies. I Mr. wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. Mr. Combs, Mr. Munger, Supervisor Munger and I this morning <coughs> asked Mr. Smith that if he would consider we'd like to apply to the part of this to the CSAC uh, application for uh, the fall convention. I think it's both the work program for the youth, the work program that's public-private in this system are all right. uh, very deserving of an award this, this year for that. I spoke to Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, I mentioned it to Mr. Smith and I also spoke to uh, Ms. Wheeler in my office today about making sure those applications got in, and I'm sure we will be doing that. Matter of fact, we, brought, we got the applications today in the mail, and I talked to Larry about it, and, and I think there's about three programs that I think that staff has put together that's really innovative that uh, might be pilot programs for the state, mm -hmm. and they've really come around with some good programs that really, really are good candidates for CSEC. Okay. Thank you very much. We will see that those applications get in. Good. Well, I'm going to put some action behind this, Mr. Smith. I'll buy you lunch tomorrow, and I'll give you a shirt.
<laughs> okay, our next item is uh, non-appearance items. Vacancies, but no, uh, notice and appointments can be made to the in-home supportive services advisory committee. And I do believe we do have one applicant. Amar Singh. Yes, I'd like to point uh, Amar Singh to the IHSS Advisory Committee. Do have a motion? Is there a second? second? A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. And then we have a vacancy uh, has been noticed an appointment can be made to the Fish and Game Advisory Commission. Um, it's for the 4th District and I'd like to appoint Brian Jeremiah. I will second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that brings us into correspondence. Items 20 through 41. Is there anything to discuss there? Seeing none, that brings us to the public comment period again. As a renewal from the audience, I'd like to address the board on those items that we've talked about. Seeing none, business. Other business board of supervisors, um, Mr. Silva? I have nothing this evening, thank you. Ms. Becker? I have nothing, thank you. Mr. Nelson? I have nothing. Mr. Munger? Yeah, the only thing I have, and it's also with committee members, uh, the Substance Abuse Advisory Committee, we're down real low on some people, jobs moving around to Sacramento, different places, so we're short people there. And so if anybody would like to be on the Substance Abuse Advisory, please let, you know, come to the uh, uh, clerk's office and sign up. Uh, we meet on the uh, second Monday of each month at noon at the mental health office, but uh, we're needing some uh, people on the committee. And I have nothing else, thank you. Hey, George, could you uh, let us in on what may be going on this weekend on Saturday? What the chairman committed the board to? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're planning an opening, uh, cutting a ribbon for the solar computer bikeway project. Um, we're planning an opening ceremony in the uh, um, we've been meeting with the bike, bicycle group in Yuba Sutter area. They're going to be helping us with that. Um, the opening ceremony is proposed to start at 9 o'clock, and uh, uh, there'll be some refreshments uh, served, and uh, we're meeting at the Humphrey Road area and the bike, bike lane. There's a small parking lot there. Uh, the suggestion from the bicycle group, and it wasn't my suggestion, that the board uh, would be riding their bikes. So you're all invited to do that if you wish. It's 9 o'clock Saturday. Right. This They'll Saturday. provide a bike for us to ride. I may have to put training wheels back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At Humphrey Road. Boy. It's Humphrey Road. Humphrey yes. Road. So we don't have to ride very far. Well, Humphrey and what? Uh, Humphrey, Humphrey and the bike, and the bike path. path. Yeah. yeah. It's right there at the parking lot. If you've been out there, we'll be set up right there, and, and uh, refreshments will be there. And assume we'll ride from there on out towards Sutter and then back. Sounds good. There are several people that came to the Public Works Committee that were dealing with the safety items, and gosh, we couldn't get them to quiet down about all of the uh, accolades that were given us that dealt with it. And even though it's the public's money, um, but they were really pleased with how the whole thing has turned out, and they were just. Uh, happy as could be, and they had a few suggestions on things that could make things better in the future. And uh, so I promised I'd be there with my riding shorts on to kind of have that thingy in the back. So yet yeah, your hiney doesn't hurt too badly. And uh, so I promised I'd do that. But it would be nice if the rest of the board members could be there in their riding gear and bicycles and... We'll be there with the bells on. And training wheels. And training wheels. And training wheels as required. <laughs> Can I bring a quad? I just ride my quad out there along. <laughs> oh, that's not fair. No, 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 no gasoline vehicles. That's allowed. right. Illegal. Is there anything from staff? Nothing. Anything for good of the order? In that case, I'll call the meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>